Hey guys, welcome back to my channel or welcome if you're new here. My name is April and I have been a nursing professor for more than 10 years. Today is going to be another video in our quick pathophysiology series. And as you can see, we are going to be talking about diabetes mellitus. This is one of my favorite topics and I'm super excited to be presenting a very quick look at pathophysiology. Okay, so when we think about diabetes mellitus, this is a common chronic and very complex disorder. And what's happening is, as we have impaired nutrient metabolism, and that impairment affects every body system. Now, glucose is going to be the first nutrient that's impaired, but because of that glucose impairment, we are very quickly going to see changes in the way that fat and protein are metabolized throughout the body. Okay, so this is the most important thing I'm going to say today. Before you can understand how glucose is being abnormally metabolized, or I guess not metabolized in diabetes mellitus, you really have to understand how glucose is normally metabolized in the body. Now, the good news is, is I do have a video on my channel about normal glucose regulation, and I will link that in the card up above, and I will also link it in the description box below. So please make sure that you have watched that video first, so you clearly understand normal glucose regulation, and then you can better understand abnormal glucose regulation. Now, our goal with diabetes mellitus is going to be to maintain blood glucose levels in the normal range, and that is called euglycemia. So when you hear that word, that just means normal blood glucose levels, and that's going to help us prevent those long-term macro and microvascular complications of diabetes mellitus. Other goals are to prevent hypoglycemia and prevent hyperglycemia thus maintaining euglycemia throughout the body. Okay, so euglycemia is a fasting blood glucose range of 74 to 106 milligrams per deciliter. Now I do use the Iggy med surge book. So if you're using a different med surge book and that glucose range gets altered just a little bit in your book, just do know that reference ranges do vary based on your textbook. So definitely go with whatever your textbook says. Although the general range for a fasting blood glucose should be somewhere around 74 to 106 milligrams per deciliter. Hyperglycemia is blood glucose greater than 106, and this is due to insufficient insulin to metabolize glucose. So your client is eating carbohydrates, which are our main source of glucose, but there isn't any insulin or the body is resistant to that insulin and it can't be metabolized. Hypoglycemia is going to be the opposite. This is where our blood glucose is going to be less than 74 milligrams per deciliter. This is going to be where the client has taken into too much exogenous insulin or they have insufficient glucose intake. Okay, so let's talk about the consequences of an absence of insulin. So insulin is required to move glucose from the bloodstream into the cells. And once in the cells, that glucose is converted to energy. Well, guess what? Every function in our body requires energy. Um, whether you're sitting on the couch, watching Netflix, you have to have energy for your heart to beat and for your respiratory effort to happen. So we always need energy. Even even at a resting state. Well, without insulin, this glucose can't be pushed into the cells and converted to energy. So insufficient insulin production could be the problem, or it could be that our body has become, our tissues have become resistant to the insulin that is being produced by our pancreas. But either way, this lack of insulin or resistance to insulin is preventing the cells from being able to convert glucose to energy. And so the big question is, is what happens now? Well, the body still needs energy to function. That doesn't change just because we don't have enough insulin to use glucose. So the body is going to start to break down fat first and then protein for energy. So those are just not sufficient forms of energy for our body. But glucose, unfortunately, is now building up in the bloodstream, right? Because it can't be pushed to the cells. Now our body's going to solve the energy problem by breaking down fat and then protein, but we still have all this glucose that's building up in our bloodstream and that's going to disrupt fluid and electrolyte balance. That's going to cause our three classic signs of hyperglycemia, polyuria, polydipsia, and polyphagia. So let's talk more about those three symptoms. So polyuria is excess urine production and also frequency of urine or urination caused by osmotic diuresis. And now, of course, we have electrolytes and water that are lost in our urine. So we have electrolyte and fluid imbalances. So this is going to lead to fluid volume deficit or dehydration. Polydipsia is excessive thirst, and that's just due to the dehydration that the body is experiencing. And polyphagia 
Asia is excessive hunger. Even though the client's eating, they're still very, very, very hungry because the cells are starving. The cells need glucose, but they can't get any. So the cells are starving. Even though the client is hungry and they're eating, they are losing weight. Okay, so let's talk about the consequences of fat metabolism. So there are some really significant consequences of our body breaking down fat for energy. So when fat is broken down for energy, ketone bodies are produced and ketones are going to collect in the blood. And initially they're going to spill out into the urine. However, at some point there's going to be so many of them that they are going to accumulate in the blood. This is called ketonemia. And unfortunately this ketonemia is going to disrupt our acid base balance. And now we are going to end up in metabolic acidosis. Now, of course, as uh, our body goes into metabolic acidosis, our respiratory system is going to try to compensate for that. So we're going to see the rate and depth of our respirations increase, and we're going to see those Kussmaul respirations. So that's what we call that increased rate and depth of respirations as the body attempts to blow off that carbon dioxide and raise the pH level. Breath that's being blown off in those Kussmaul's respirations, it has that rotting citrus fruit smell or that fruity breath odor that sometimes you'll see in a test question. That's the acetone that's being exhaled in an attempt to raise a pH level back into a normal level. Now, initially our body is going to have a low potassium level because that lack of insulin causing that polyuria, we're losing electrolytes, including potassium in the urine. But as that acidosis increases, so as that pH level decreases and our acidosis gets worse, our cells are going to rupture. They're going to die because they can't live in that acidotic state. And now potassium, which lives inside of the cells is going to leave the cells because they've ruptured and it's going to travel into the bloodstream. And now we can have a very, very high potassium level. And of course, we know that there are many cardiovascular consequences of having a high potassium level. Now, in addition to all of these other problems that are going on, the body is in an extreme state of dehydration. So that's leading to hemoconcentration or that thick blood because we've lost the water through the urination and hypovolemia. And we have decreased tissue perfusion because of that hemo concentration. And that's going to, of course, lead to hypoxia. Now, all of that is also going to disrupt the Krebs cycle. And we're going to have lactic acid production that increases. And that's just going to even make our acidosis worse. So we've now mentioned Kussmaul's respirations as they are portrayed in a client with diabetic ketoacidosis. Now let's watch this pediatric patient display this type of breathing. All right. This little guy actually presents here. He's, he's a known insulin dependent diabetic and he's come in with a pH of like 6.9. He's actually got a little bit of a a dental, probably a dental abscess has kind of kicked him off here, but um, he's, his, uh, his breathing is really what we kind of call Kuzmar breathing, and when you, when you uh, smell his breath, it, it basically has a uh, very sweet kind of a acetone, ketone sort of odor to it, uh, so he's getting his, uh, uh, getting a little fluid bolus well, of 20 per kilo, and then we're going to also give, start him at 0.1 units per kilogram per hour of, um, of insulin, and he's going up to the intensive care unit. Okay, so hopefully you noted on the screen that this little guy's serum glucose is 543 milligrams per deciliter. His pH is 6.95, so that is acidotic. We do know that in diabetic ketoacidosis, that is a metabolic acidosis, and he is compensating for this metabolic acidosis with the hyperventilation, the Kussmaul respirations, which has his PaCO2 at 19.8. Now, if you also noticed, his potassium level is starting to elevate at 5.5 three, and that is a result of the metabolic acidosis. So that leads us to diabetic ketoacidosis, otherwise known as DKA. Now this is a life-threatening state of insulin insufficiency. So we have absolutely no insulin production happening. And we tend to think about DKA associated with type one diabetes. So when insulin is unavailable for cellular metabolism, we've already said the body is going to break down fat. That is the first uh, energy nutrient that will be broken down when glucose is not available. That fat breakdown, of course, produces those fatty acids and ketone bodies. That's going to accumulate leading to that metabolic acidosis. Our pH is going to lower. Our cells are going to die. 
our potassium level is going to rise. And now we have dehydration, severe electrolyte imbalances, severe fluid imbalances, acidosis are all going to lead to coma and death if this situation is not reversed. Okay, guys, that's all I have for you today on diabetes mellitus. Hopefully you found this very quick introduction to the pathophysiology of diabetes helpful. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. You can email me. You can leave a comment down below. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Now, Remember, don't forget, if you don't understand normal glucose regulation in the body, I will have that video linked in the description box below. So please make sure you watch that. And then you can always come back to this video and learn more about the pathophysiology of diabetes mellitus. Have a wonderful day and I will see you in the next video.